Stephen arrived here in the Bay Area 50 years ago and in that time period created an extraordinary body of work in many forms, shape, media. I remember knowing Stephen at a distance as this artist with tremendous ability, tremendous strength. Stephen grew up outside St. Louis and was immersed very early in his life in both nature and in culture, climbing along the White River near their family farm in Indiana, and walking and crawling and sort of uh, climbing into these caves, these crevices in the white uh, cliffs along the river. He said, I sometimes think that all my formative influences can be traced to those experiences along the White River in Indiana. His work really speaks to a post-war sensibility that is very much about existentialism and our, our experience in an existential world of our own bodies and then our relationship to the world around us. You feel like you're encountering another human being when you stand in front of one of his human sculptures. He's dealing with the human condition, the suffering, the struggle, the search for meaning, and he's dealing with existentialism, this post-war feeling that perhaps we are physically spiritually, psychically disengaged uh, from the world around us, that we needed to reconnect with our natural roots in the earth itself, in clay indeed itself. He loved clay. He just loved the fact that you can kind of squeeze it, you can push the clay, it had your finger marks in there. He, uh, he used his body to shape part of the sculpture. It looks like, uh, like his, his arm or his leg was, was embedded. Uh, in, in, in clay. He actually would jump or throw himself into or onto many of his early works. Uh, he joked about it later on. It came a little more difficult to do that with the passing years. Uh, Steve really didn't like machines. He, he, he stayed away from, from motorized saws and, and dangerous equipment. This tool is uh, one that Stephen had used and uh, if you look at any, any of his sculptures you know that, that they, were, they were shaped with a lot of force. In addition to his body, Stephen was, was this atypical type of person who used any tool that he felt would give him the shape. Two by fours, four by fours, uh, tools that you would never find at a ceramic supply store. This, I believe, also came from this Taylor studio. Not your typical uh, clay sli slicing tool, and I'm not exactly sure how it ended up here, but I I've used it a few times, and it has good karma, good Stephen karma. He lived a life of great simplicity. He built his own studio by hand. He built his house in the Berkeley Hills by hand. His entire life as a sculptor, he worked with his hands, even when he was working with bronzes. He had the most extraordinary eye. Stephen was so sensitive to everything around him in his visual environment, to nuances most of us can never see or comprehend, and yet it showed the degree of visual acuity that he had, and of course, the artistry that he had. He would take his metal oxide colors and mold and meld them into the raw clay body and then fire it as an integral whole. He infused the clay with like iron oxide and maybe manganese dioxide and uh, cobalt and uh, then glaze stains which are body stains which can give you pinks and blues and I remember when red, red was available he was started to use red and oranges. Color was an emotional issue. It wasn't color just to make something look pretty. It was something to draw emotion in, in not only himself, of course, but the viewer. You don't have that shiny, slick surface glaze that we all associate with traditional ceramics. You have a matte finish that looks weathered and worn. Volkes was a huge driving, driving uh, you know, influence for Stephen. In fact, Peter was one of the few people I recall uh, Stephen talking about. I could probably name four or five art, well, artists, such as uh, Isamu Noguchi, I remember him talking about. Manuel Neri, he talked about, maybe June Kaneko and uh, Bob Artisan's name came up once in a while, but Peter Volkus was the one artist whose name came up all the time. Your whole body, physically, mentally, should be fully engaged with the materials, and very importantly, that you should be open to chance occurrences, that mistakes or unexpected outcomes might arise, but that you should embrace them fully. Here's Stephen excitedly waiting for the master to, to say something. So I said, what happened, Steve? He said, Peter came over and said, what is that, a turkey? Although Stephen de Stabler studied religion when he was at Princeton University, he himself was not practicing in any particular religion. And so it became a great challenge when the Catholic Church offered him a commission for the Holy Spirit Chapel in Newman Hall here at Berkeley. 
Stephen had to, among other things, actually render a crucifix with Christ on the cross for this chapel in a very traditional iconography, of course. And he had to do the altar, the priest's chair, the tabernacle, um, and the other accoutrements of a traditional Catholic chapel. The amazing thing about the Holy Spirit Chapel is that Stephen found a way, on the one hand, to acknowledge traditional Christian iconography, like Christ on the cross, but then to inform it with modern and ancient ideas. He cast the figure of Christ from an actual human being. So it looks not like an unattainable godlike figure, but like someone who might indeed, as he did, live right near you. It's the only completely intact human body that Destabler ever made as an artist. The lectern in the Holy Spirit Chapel, where of course the priest would preside and read the Word of God, if you invert it in your mind's eye, you will see that in fact there is a deity-like mask or face with eyes, a nose, and a tongue. And the tongue forms the reading surface of the lectern. So the word of God is literally given by this figure, by this head, by this deity, and then of course the Bible or scripture itself is read upon that surface. Steve was really philosophical. Everything had that little, little, uh, uh, real soulful, soulful edge to it. Very open. And Stephen never really panicked. Never panicked, of course. That's a good thing they invented epoxy. People who worked with him in the last few years of his life when he resurrected, dug up, archaeologically excavated these boneyard fragments were astounded that he would remember 40 years later, go up the hill to that tree at the upper left and at about three o'clock, if you dig, you'll find a foot. And there it would be. And he would go into the studio with an assistant and make these extraordinarily moving portraits of humanity. Many of them feel like they're actually self-portraits. One of them is called Thorax Figure. It is a gift of the artist to the de Young Museum here in San Francisco. And in that sculpture, you see this decrepit, bent over, decaying, fragmentary human figure, a little bit stooped, a little bit smaller than life size, um, one ankle is missing and is resting on a stone block as if you might see a fragmentary ancient statue being propped up artificially. And when his wife walked into the gallery the first time for the installation, she looked at that piece and she said, oh, it's Stephen's ankle. Um, he had actually injured his ankle both in, as a child as, and as an adult. And so there are these very poignant self-portrait elements in these late works. Stephen, at the end of his life, was confronting his own mortality. He had spent five decades wrestling with these issues, mortality, immortality, spirituality, materiality. But at the end, what I think is most moving about these late boneyard sculptures is that they are a testament not only to his own humanity and humanism, but that they accept that this is the state of the human condition, that we are all mortal, that we will all die, and yet there's beauty in that too.